Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, you're all very welcome to the latest um, Chagas Research Insight webinar. And the purpose of these we webinars is to update the public out on the latest Chagas research. My name is Pat Dillon, and I'm going to be your host for this morning. The title of this morning's webinar is Increasing Nitrogen Use Efficiency in Pasture-Based Systems. As you'll appreciate, this is really important from a both a farming point of view and an environmental point of view. Nitrogen in recent times has got a lot of, uh, a lot of focus. We know that excessive use of nitrogen uh, has a negative effect on water quality. And you can refer back to the two latest reports we have seen in recent times from the EPA. We also know that changing from calcium ammonia nitrate to protected urea reduces greenhouse gas emissions and reduces ammonia emissions. Earlier this year, we had the publication of the Ag Climatized Roadmap, which has set out a, a roadmap for climate neutrality by 2050. And in that, the department outlined a 10% reduction in chemical fertilizer by 2025, and a 50, uh, tw sorry, a 10% uh, reduction by 2025 and a 20% by 2030. We know at the end of this year on our current nitrate action program expires and as well as our nitrate delegation. So they, they have to be renewed in the meantime. Over six months ago, the Department of Agriculture asked Chagas to investigate different, uh, to analyze different mitigation me um, uh, measures to reduce nitrogen losses from, uh, from pasture-based systems. And uh, this is uh, available currently on the Chagas website. And a fair amount of the results from this uh, report will be shown uh, in the presentations this morning. So each presenter has about 15, we have three presenters this morning, each has 15 minutes to present. And at the end of that, we should have about 10 minutes for discussion. For attendees that want to ask questions and are really support that they should ask questions, you can use the, quest, the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. And we, it would be helpful also to identify the person that you're addressing those questions to. So as I said, we have three speakers. I'll introduce the first speaker first and then move through the three other two speakers. So our first speaker is Brendan Horn, and he's going to speak about latest research results from the Cotton's Baron on increasing nitrogen use efficiency. Over to you, Brendan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just in terms of my presentation this morning, it's just really focusing on nitrogen efficiency and the Curtin's farm experience and some insights from that. Briefly, by way of introduction, um, the context for increasing nitrogen efficiency is, as Pat has outlined, based on a lot of the pressures now in terms of improving water quality, both nationally and at a European level. So our water framework directives require that all water, all, all water bodies achieve good water status by 2027 at the latest, Currently, Ireland has 57% of its rivers reaching that ecological status. And uh, I suppose there are some challenges, though, in terms of what the recent report shows, that 47% of rivers are at unsatisfactory nitrate concentrations. And indeed, there are 38% of sites where nitrate concentrations are actually increasing. So on the Ireland map here on the right-hand side, you can see areas where you have orange or red dots represent points where we're seeing rising nitrate concentrations in terms of river water bodies. So obviously we need to redress those trends. Um, in terms of the wider policy picture, I suppose the EU Green Deal and Farm to Fork strategy has set out that we need to see a 50% reduction in nutrient losses by 2030 right across Europe. So again, that forms part of the basis on which uh, I suppose, you know, agriculture needs to respond and it is a significant pressure in terms of meeting some of these targets. In terms of my presentation and these insights this morning it is very much based on a publication uh, that we uh, reported from the Curtin's Farm from 2013. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on that publication from the Carsrue Institute of Technology, Philip Blum, and from Johnstown Castle, uh, Chagas, uh, Carl Richards, Owen Fenton, uh, Jim Grant, and also Manuela Hoops, Hoops who's, who completed our PhD on this work. Before we get into the detail, I suppose it's important when we start talking about nitrogen use and nitrogen flows that we, we think in, in terms of the principles of nitrogen movement in our systems. And in large part, basically, we need to think in terms of the inputs of, first, of, of end sources to the system. So here we have fertilizers, uh, feed, clover fixation in clover-based systems. 
The animal per se, per se actually recycles the nitrogen within the system rather than creating nitrogen in of themselves. And then you have the outputs from the system, which in a dairy system largely correspond to milk, some meat, and in some cases feed or perhaps very exports from the system. And I suppose that it's the relationship between the inputs and outputs that derives the efficiency of nitrogen use within the system. There are a number of important soil processes happening under, uh, underneath that are also important. But fundamentally, when we talk about free draining soils and nitrogen contribution to groundwaters, we're talking particularly about nitrate leaching. And it's largely derived by the relationship between the inputs and the outputs. So in terms of some of the definitions, uh, the two main ones we need to consider are the total nitrogen surplus, or it's often called the nitrogen balance, which is measured in kilos of nitrogen per hectare. This is basically the, the total N inputs to the system from all forms, feed, fertilizer, fixation, and so on, less the total N exports from the system in the form of milk, meat, and so on. So obviously, the lower that balance, the lower the excess nitrogen in the system. The second one is the total nitrogen use efficiency, which is a, measured as a percentage. And it is described as the total nitrogen outputs divided by the total nitrogen available within the system. So these are the two main parameters we use when we're thinking about our systems. In terms of, I suppose, looking at farms and farmers benchmarking nitrogen efficiency on their farms, we particularly to simplify and to be more, uh, I suppose, easy to measure, we talk about the farm gate or purchased end surplus end use efficiency, which effectively is talking about just the, the purchase sources of end input, feed and fertilizer mainly, and the main end exports in the form of meat and milk sales. And um, so it simplifies the system somewhat. If we want to think about improvement practices and pathways, then to improve nitrogen efficiency in a grazing system, you have two options. One is that you reduce the end surplus so that means either using less N in your system by using, for example, lower concentrate feed, lower crude protein feeds or less chemical fertilizers, or indeed that you uh, increase the N output from the system by, for example, more efficient cows with higher um, milk protein sales and so on. The second option then is, is to try and reduce the nitrate leaching pathways. So that's a bit more complex. That's about fertilizer timings versus water movement in soils, grazing practices, inhibitors, and so on. So these are broadly the, the I suppose, the levers that we have at our disposal in, uh, to, to deal with nitrogen efficiency in a grazing system. Our objective in terms of, I suppose, this study was to describe the spatial and the temporal trends in groundwater nitrogen concentrations and its relationship to site characteristics, climate, and farm management. And uh, this was a decadal study, uh, commenced in 2001 and ran to 2011. And in the study, we monitored nitrogen concentrations from between nine and 12 borehole wells over the period, um, drilled into the groundwater beneath the site. We had detailed paddock-specific management data, fertilizer, slurry, grazing practices, receding, and so on. Obviously, very detailed climatic data in terms of rainfall, the evaporation from the site, uh, so the movement of water back up, and then drainage, which is the net contribution of water down through the site, and then very detailed specific physical and geological information. So looking at the characteristics of different parts of the site and their impact. So this is the data set on which I'll report in these insights. Just a little bit more detail on the study site. Um, Nitrate loss is primarily a problem for free draining soils. It's about leaching in large part, and it's about, I suppose, greater water movement on the site. And the Curtin site, which as you can see there from the maps located in, in North Cork, is basically on top of an important uh, regional uh, karst aquifer for the, for, and, and so it's a significantly important site, and it's one of the most free draining sites in the country. It's in the top 1% of sites in terms of free draining. So this is a very, very risky site for nutrient losses, in particular in terms of nitrate leaching. In terms of that site then, this is a profile of the 48 hectares that we used. And we've done a lot of extensive analysis in terms of the movement of water on that site. So different forms of analysis. In this case, this is a conductivity survey which shows you the boreholes, are, uh, where they are located on the site, and also the depths of soil on top of the site. So soil is like the skin on uh, which we farm. And obviously the shallower the soil, the darker the zones, the more risky nutrient loss in those parts of the farm. And this also shows the general direction of water movement at the site. So it's all entering groundwater ultimately, which flows to the river function and onto the black water. So look, that's the outline of the site. And by virtue of having this data, then we can create this kind of a picture across the site for each year. So you've got, you know, on average, you've got a meter to three meters of uh, topsoil uh, across the site. You've got all the agricultural practices in terms of having a top, spreading fertilizer, slurries, grazing, uh, harvesting feeds, and so on. 
Then you've got this karst uh, uh, unsaturated uh, zone, which is like a brickwork effect, um, which is very dry and rapid movement of water within that area down to the saturated zone, where, which is your water table. And that's on average about 30 meters down and moves around quite a bit over the season. And we've drilled the wells into this groundwater in order to sample them consistently over the period. In terms of the results from that analysis, so to begin with, climate is a huge effect, and that will be elaborated on more by my colleague Elodie in a, in a little while. But for the most part, climate data for the period we were measuring was very similar to the long-term trends. So here we have the 30-year average rainfall at the site set out by month. So on average, just over a meter of rainfall during the 10-year period. And in the, sorry, over the 30-year period, and in the 10-year period, in fact, was very, very similar to that. The effective drainage then is when you take from, from that rainfall the evapotranspiration, which is the, you know, during dry periods when water moves upwards. And the net drainage, so the net water movement down through the site over the 30 year period was around 540 uh, millimeters compared to about 478 during this period. So again, very similar to the long term trends. When we start to look at the nitrate concentrations in groundwater, so this really is the gold standard for nitrogen loss to, to the system because we're measuring it into the groundwater and, and you know, 90% of our rivers come from the groundwater sources. So when we looked at that over the 10 year period, you can see here uh, in terms of the mean nitrate concentration at the beginning of the period was in the order of 16 milligrams of nitrate per liter. Per liter. And you can see based on the gray area, there was quite a degree of variation around that mean in terms of the different boreholes, different times of the year, in terms of the nitrogen uh, concentrations at that time. And over the course of the decade, you can see that that trend was pretty steady the first half of the decade. And thereafter, for the second half of that decade, there was a steady decline in nitrate concentration to the point where nitrate concentration by 2011, and largely since as we've continued to monitor those wells, has been in the order of six milligrams of nitrate per liter. To put that in context, this line here is a very important, the line that's the horizontal line reflects the EU nitrates directive maximum allowable concentrations of nitrate in groundwater, and that's set at 11.3. So consistently for the second half of the period, the nitrate concentration at the site was below that MAC allowable concentrations. In fact, if you look at the load then, which is taking your nitrogen concentrations and multiplying them by the effective drainage, which is the water movement through the site, you can see that the actual amount of end load at the groundwater was reduced from a, a peak of about 70, 75 kilos per hectare at the beginning of the period to a, a low of approximately 25 kilos per hectare at the end of the period. So a substantial change in terms of nitrogen efficiency and nitrogen loss from the site. Just to look at perhaps more of the agronomic practices then, so what, what, what changed at the site over that period? Well, the biggest singular change is probably the legislation and the imposition of the U European Nitrates Directive in 2006. And I suppose in terms of farm practice as a site, there is a number of experiments ongoing at this site all the time. Uh, in terms of the general average for the site though, the actual stocking rate in terms of cows per hectare at the site increased over the decade from 2.3 at the beginning to 2.9, which was the maximum allowable level under the Nitrates Directive at the end. There was a greater focus on grazing and increasing grazing season length. So a big transition at farm level as well as in research to increase the number of grazing days, uh, start grazing earlier and finish later uh, over that period. And uh, so grazing days increased from, you know, the mid 250s up to over 300 grazing days for a large part of the period. So a big reliance on grazing. Uh, in terms of the nitrate directive, the biggest singular impact that had was to require us to use fewer amounts of chemical nitrogen. So our chemical nitrogen use reduced from approximately 300 kilos in the first part of that period to 250 kilos for the second part of the decade. And that, that's probably the biggest uh, end source effect in this. The second part of it then is just output and productivity from the site. And in terms of fat and protein sales per hectare, which is the milk solids per cow times the stocking rate, you can see that actual productivity at the site increased over that decade. So we went from lower stocking rates and lower protein content and lower performance at the start of the decade, right through to very high levels of performance through the middle and towards the end of the decade. So that documents largely the I suppose the biology in terms of the end inputs and exports. So back to our nutrient surplus nutrient use efficiencies, our total end imports to the system reduced from approximately 330 to 350 kilos of end per hectare at the beginning of that period to about 275 kilos of end per hectare at the end of the period. So a substantial reduction in nitrogen inputs to the system 
And at the same time, because of the increased productivity of the system, better focus on grazing and uh, higher protein content in milk and so on, and high EBI animals indeed, the actual outputs from the system increased over the period. So you were taking out approximately 95 kilos of uh, AIN in the form of, largely in the form of milk product from the system at the end of the period, compared to about 80 at the beginning. So the total impact of these two changes, or these changes, were to reduce our total N surplus at the site, which is again the surplus of N over the exports from about 250 kilos of N surplus to about 175 kilos of N surplus. So a substantial reduction in the N surplus and correspondingly then the increase in N use efficiency because the output increased, N use efficiency increased from around 25%, which is very similar to average the average dairy farm today, to in the order of 35 and 36% by the end of the period. So substantial improvements in nitrogen efficiency across the site. So what are the practices then that changed over that decade um, as we focused on this and, and, and what impacts th that had large impact in terms of, of uh, nitrogen loss and nitrogen efficiency? And these again will be focused on in later presentations by Elodie and Lawrence. The first one is the reduction in fertilizer application level. So there was a substantial reduction in fertilizer application level, which reduced the end surplus and therefore, um, I suppose, less nitrogen was available for loss from the system. But equally, it's important for people to remember that there are other informs into the system and the reduction in concentrate usage between experiments and also reducing the concentrate nitrogen component, which is the crude protein content, had a big singular effect also. So we were able to reduce the nitrogen input to the system from both feed and fertilizer sources. The increase in milk output by virtue of uh, uh, high calving rates, more compact calving, improved genetics, more uh, elite animals with better uh, performance for grazed grass, and indeed better grazing management practices, post-grazing residuals, rotation lengths, and so on over that period, um, corresponded to an increase in animal productivity, which again increases the outputs and reduces the surplus. Monitoring the site over the decade, it, was, it became apparent that where we were doing uh, full-scale uh, plowing of the site to do receding, we were seeing higher nitrate elevated nitrate levels in some of the boreholes as well. So the adoption of full min, min till cultivation receding, where we do one pass cultivation and uh, recede on top of that with minimal soil disturbance, uh, that became the practice of choice um, in terms of receding and had an improvement benefit. Also the distribution of slurries, where we improved the distribution of slurries, particularly using more slurries in spring to, I suppose, replace chemical fertilizer at that part of the year, but also then over the full site and the full year, making sure that there was an even distribution of nutrient use across all paddocks. So very close to all paddocks were getting very similar nutrient use between slurry and fertilizer. That was an important uh, feature because obviously a high risk parts of the site, then you're going to lose more in from that. So evening out that distribution is very important. And then finally, the preferential management of the high risk zone. So we were very accurately able to identify the high risk zones on the site. And in consequence, then we were able to manage those preferentially to ensure that there wasn't higher levels of nitrogen being used in those, in those places and that animal management and such was that, you know, there was lower levels of loss from that. So these are largely the agronomic practices that underpinned the reduction in nitrogen losses and the increase in nitrogen use efficiency at that site over that period. So to conclude then, just in terms of my presentation, and again, this will be followed up by Elodie in terms of the, the climate and site characteristics, Climate and uh, physical characteristics have hugely influential components in terms of nutrient losses. And, and I suppose, look, as climate change impacts upon us, that becomes more, um, that becomes more uh, expressed as well. So we have to be careful about that. In, in, in the overall study period, we saw that we could achieve a reduction in N losses from the site and also an increase in milk production over the 10 year period. So for this study, we were able to decouple productivity from actual in, in loss from the system. And that's very encouraging. And you know, that shows the way in terms of farm practice, in terms of maintaining profitability and productivity while also achieving these targets. And then finally, in terms of the farm management practices that had a significant effect, you have to reduce the end surplus through feed and fertilizer in order to make improvements in, uh, in losses to water, improved utilization of slurries and dirty waters at the site, also give an improvement, minimal cultivation receding, and I suppose it wasn't addressed by this study, but the whole research uh, project is based on good basic principles around stocking rate, good soil fertility, and so on, so that for whatever levels of nutrients we're using in these systems, we're getting the maximum return in terms of uh, performance. So, Pat, that's where I leave it. That's in terms of the conclusions from this study. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks for that. Um... 
So don't forget to put your questions in on the question and answer function at the bottom of the of the thing, of the of the, the, the presentation. So now we'll move on to our second uh, uh, speaker this morning. It's Eridu Ruel, uh, and she will talk about nitrogen nitrogen mitigation strategies uh, to increase nitrogen use efficiency. So over to you, Eridu. Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Elodie Ruel, and uh, I'm here to speak to you about mod some modeling work we did about nitrogen surplus and nitrogen leaching. So Brendan was speaking about an experiment here. We're going to speak about simulation. Uh, and the good thing about simulation and modeling is it allows us to test a lot of different things, which would take like years and years to do in reality, and um, so it's easier. So I'm gonna first present you uh, with the different scenario we had to do and we did. The main output of a scenario and then I'm gonna really insist on how we could improve all that or, or we could reduce nitrogen leaching and so on through precision nitrogen management. And we're gonna take an example which is 2018 and how we could have done better in 2018. So first of all, a bit of background, uh, as it has been said already, that was actually a work which has been requested by the Department of Agricultural Food and the Marine. They asked us to test different scenarios to see um, how we could reduce nitrogen leaching uh, in our uh, dairy farms. And they asked us to compare to everything to um, a base farm, which, uh, which has a free draining soil, because as Brendan says, the leaching is really a problem on free draining soil, but not really on heavy soil. So it will just, we are just looking at free draining soil in this presentation. A stocking rate, the base stocking rate would be of 2.75 co per hectare because that's the maximal allowed to derogation at the minute. So it's the corresponding to an, an organic N of 250. And uh, 250 kilogram of chemical nitrogen is applied each year per hectare, once again, because it's a maximum which is allowed at the minute. And what did they ask us to look at? It was first uh, variation in chemical N, so variation of that 250. So either a 10 or 20% reduction, but also they ask us to look at what if a farmer is actually putting, is overspreading, putting more than that 250. What are the consequences of put people basically not following the law? Is it a real big problem or not? Then once again, same, same idea. What happened when a uh, farmer put, uh, spread some slurry during, during the close period? So in December, either 12% of the slurry available or 25%. And we have tested what would happen if it spread in December. So once again, it's not something which should happen, but it what we, but which happened. So what are the consequences there? And then they ask us to look at stocking rate. So variation in terms of stocking rate. So once again, a reduction of 10% of that stocking rate. So reduction compared to the 2.75 co per hectare. And also what the consequences in terms of leaching, once again, of the platform stocking rate. So which me, when we call platform here, it's really every hectare that the co has access to at least once is within the platform and the rest is just silent or there's never no uh, any animal on it. So I will come back on that when we're on that slide. And what's good with the model we're using and what we could do is that we could use, we could simulate the variation between years. So we use 18 years of weather data. Uh, it was actually from the weather station in Moorpark. We could have used other one, um, but the main message will be there through those 18 years, and we'll, we'll actually start with that. So um, it's a type of graph I'm gonna show a good bit. It's to highlight there's a year-to-year -year variation in nitrogen leaching, such as our base simulation, so the 2.75 co per hectare stocking rate with 250 kilogram of nitrogen applied. Here uh, you have your nitrogen leaching. So you see it's go from less, a bit less than 40 to a bit less than 90. And here you have the variability, you have the different years. So we started at 2003 and the last year of weather we used is 2020. And what you can see is there's a very big variation, you know, dot going up and down and so on. And so it actually went from um, 39 kilogram leach at one meter to 88 kilogram of nitrogen leach. 
And what I really want to highlight is that it was the same management in all years. Okay, the farmer may have to feed more concentrate or silage, especially, for example, in 2018, when there was not enough grass and so on. But it was the same stocking rate, um, the same fertilizer applied. So the, all the variation, that big variation you're seeing there, it's only due to actually variation in weather. And that's something we really need to acknowledge. There's going to be some good year. There's going to be some bad year. So what we need to know is how can we improve the bad years. Uh, the result of what, now let's go to the result of what they ask us to do. So a uh, variation in uh, chemical fertilizer application. Um, so the 250 here is your base, as I said, uh, that's the average of the 18 years and you have an average yearly leaching of 62 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, that's your average. If you reduce by 10 or by 20% the nitrogen applied, you will have a reduction in leaching around two to almost 5% uh, if you go to 20%. So small reduction in leaching, but which is there. And then, well, if you put too much nitrogen, then you're gonna have an increase uh, in the nitrogen leach. So if you go to 300, it's almost 5% and 350, it's almost 10%. But once again, what I want to highlight is the consequences of overspreading depending on the year. So kind of the same graph, but just with color this time, you still have the nitrogen leaching, you have your year there, and each color depend, uh, correspond to a different level uh, of fertilizer applied. So the pink is a 200, the pink is the lowest, and the purple there is a 350, so the highest. What you can see, first of all, if you look a bit at all both kind of line, you know, every year, the more you're gonna put fertilizer, the more you're gonna leach, that's for sure, however, you have years like 2011 there, which is highlighted, where you know all the dots are very close to each other. So you're gonna leach a bit more, but it's not, you know, it's not that big. I would say it's almost okay. But then you have a year like 2018, where there's big, like, like any kilogram of nitrogen applied more will lead to big increase of leaching. And if you look even, you know, between that dot and that dot and that dot and that dot, those two, the two lowest one are closer than the two higher one. And what does that mean? It's really, if you go to 300 or 350 in a year like 2018, your grass won't be able to uptake, the, to uptake uh, nitrogen anymore. It's really purely wasted and it will really uh, increase leaching. So 2018, the reason for that was um, due to the drought and so on, as we all remember, I would say. But um, that some, something like that could have other reason. For example, if you have a bad soil fertility, it will be the same thing. The more at some stage when you keep putting nitrogen, the grass won't be able to uptake it anymore. And the consequences could be a big, big increase in leaching. Um, then the next thing they wanted us to look at, as I said, was the influence of uh, slurry spreading during the close period. So we're only going to look at the paddock, which would actually get slurry because you're not what would happen in that case is like not every paddock in the farm would get the slurry, just some would have. So we're only going to look at those uh, specific paddock. Uh, so as I said, it was uh, the slurry would spread the 15th of December. And so we have our base simulation, so no slurry spread at that time. You have your average exchange of for the year, for the 18 years of 62 kilogram. If you go to 12% or 25%, uh, you have an increase for those paddock once again of 5% on their leaching. So, you know, there is, you know, it is significant um, and it's something we need to avoid. Once again, if we go back to my graph and variation between years, I'm going to still uh, highlight the same things as the last time. So leaching again here, here, there. You have year like 2005 where actually in terms of leaching, there wasn't that big of an impact of um, putting slurry at the 15th of December. I'm saying that, but that doesn't mean there was no other impact. They could, they could have an impact on, uh, you know, there could be a runoff and so on. So it doesn't mean it would have been okay that years to do it, but in terms of leaching, it would have been, uh, it would have been catastrophic. But then if you take a year like 2015, that's totally the opposite. So putting slurry the 15th of December for that year would have been very, very dangerous for the environment. Then, uh, sorry, 
Then the effect of stocking rate on nitrogen leaching. So quickly, uh, we have once again our base simulation, the 2.75 kilo co per hectare stocking rate with or 62 leaching. I have added a higher stocking rate there, which is a 2.95. That's what actually Brendan spoke of. That's the previous um, uh, higher stocking rate, higher stocking rate, which was allowed, but now we are we are going to 275. So what does that mean? Is you know that two percent um, that two percent there is already won because we were there the previous year. We have to go now at 275. So we are gonna all already see a reduction of two percent in leaching. So that's a win. Then a further reduction to uh, 2.5 co per hectare will bring a, another reduction around three percent if we were going there. Um, now something a bit I find interesting and that we need to realize is a grazing platform. So we have our base simulation and in the simulation I did, it was a 40 hectare farm. So if the co had access to all the 40 hectare farm, uh, there was a leaching of 62. But then um, if you take the same number of animals, but you just give them access to 30 hectare there, so same number of animals, but just 30 hectare, so 10 other hectare would just be used for silage. Uh, if you just look at those 30 hectares there, then you have a leaching of 68 kilogram, so an increase of 10%. And if once again you take all the animal you had on 40 hectares and you put them on 24 hectares, then in that case you have an increase of leaching of 19%. So that's kind of the biggest number, the biggest percentage we have seen since the beginning. So that's very important to realize, but that's only for those 40, 30 or 24 hectares, that's not for the full farm. Um, because what happened then is for the 2.70, the 10 other hectare would be silage only, no animal on them. And what happened is um, as there is no animals and there's just grass growing, basically the leaching will be way lower on those zones. Because the problem in leaching is the urine patches of the cows, which would lead to important leaching. So if you, then we go back and we look at the full 40 hectare, in that case, uh, the increase is actually only of 1% or almost 3% for the um, 4.6. So the increase is still there, but really not the same scale. So very important to know what we are looking at. But now, after saying that, what we really need to realize also is that looking at the full farm is only relevant if the silage ground or the other ground is close to the grazing platform. If it's in another catchment, it won't balance the farm out for water quality. So we have to be careful with the grazing platform. Now we're gonna go to precision management. So uh, what was one of our big actually output or big revelation, uh, if we may say, of uh, both simulation. And uh, what I want to highlight quickly there is uh, the relationship we had for all year between nitrogen leaching and nitrogen surplus. And what I want to highlight is, first of all, if you have um, a nitrogen surplus of 300 in 2011, it would lead you to a fairly small amount of leaching and the same nitrogen surplus in 2018 would lead you to a high uh, nitrogen leaching. So, you know, once again, variability between years A is here where you're gonna leach more, that's for sure, just due to weather. But then what we can see is for those two years, there is a relationship between nitrogen uh, surplus and nitrogen leaching. But you know, in 2011, once again, the increase in nitrogen surplus does not lead to a massive increase in nitrogen leaching. While in 2018, an increase in nitrogen surplus do lead to a big increase in nitrogen leaching. And that in those years where any small reduction in uh, nitrogen surplus in 2018 would have, be very important and we, that's where we can gain. So we did a very small experiment um, simulation once again, where we tried to see what we could have done better in 2018. That just rules I tried. I'm not saying it's the best rules. That's what we should do, but that's something we can look at. So um, what I did is if the predicted grass growth in spring was lower than 10 kilogram of dry matter per hectare, if you don't uh, look at the grass growth prediction, you just could just go by soil temperature, I was delaying the nitrogen application. So it doesn't mean that I was not putting the nitrogen in, it was just, I was just maybe waiting for 
three days, one week, two weeks, depending on the time uh, to cut that nitrogen. Same story with the rainfall. If there was high rainfall forecasted for the next three days, I was not putting nitrogen. Then uh, if you remember in 2018, in March, uh, there was um, the bees from the east, so there was a snow. So both 24 kilograms of nitrogen, we should have went out in March. Actually, I did not put them in because there was no point. And the last uh, result, was, the last rules was that the main, during the main growing season, when the grass prediction went lower than 25 kilograms of dry matter, uh, same, you could make the rules when the grass, start, the grass growth on your farm may start to really decrease, I stopped putting nitrogen. Um, and what happened that in that was that instead of putting 250 kilograms of nitrogen that year, I would have put only 171 kilograms of nitrogen that year following those rules. So it's a reduction of 79 kg. And we're gonna see the consequences just now. So consequences is um, in this table. So here you have 2018 with 250 kilograms of nitrogen applied and here 171. So base simulation basically, and uh, or improved simulation. If we look at the grass growth, first of all, the grass growth for the two simulation are very close despite the fact that there was 79 kg less applied. That means that for those 79 kg in our base simulation, we actually had a nitrogen response of 3.3, which is very, very low. The grass intake actually increased with the 171. Then in terms of nitrogen surplus, the nitrogen surplus decreased by 82 kilograms of nitrogen, and that's very big, and that's actually going, becoming lower than our average of the 18 year simulation. So which is a very big win we could have done. And the nitrogen use efficiency increased by 3.4. Uh, there we can't go back to the average of the 18 years just because 2018 was such a bad year that you had to bring in a lot of feed, which will uh, decrease your nitrogen use efficiency. And more importantly, well, not more importantly, also the, light, the leaching decreased by 12 kilograms of nitrogen, which is a very big decrease. And see, we were at 77, which was fairly high uh, compared to all the simulation, the other simulation, and we almost went back to our average of the 18 year there. So that's very positive, and that's what we really need to work on. So in conclusion, there's a large year to year variation in nitrogen leaching. And we need to acknowledge that, but that's really where um, it's not, that doesn't mean we can't do anything about it. That means that's where we can uh, uh, really use uh, precision nitrogen application to reduce uh, nitrogen lynching in the bad year. Reducing nitrogen surplus per hectare did have a significant benefit in reducing uh, nitrogen leaching each year, but had a different um, benefits depending on the year. And managing to eliminating all the practice which shouldn't really exist of overuse of chemical and fertilizer and the spreading of slurry during the close period will improve water quality. Reduction of stocking rate or reduction of um, fertilizer application will have an impact, would have an impact too, but I would say it would be, the impact would be smaller, way smaller than all those three other points. And that's it for me. Thanks very much, Eddie. Really good, and it complements Brendan's uh, presentation before that. So there's lots of things we can do to increase uh, nitrogen use efficiency. So um, just before we go on to the final speaker, let me again keep the questions uh, coming in. I mean, there are questions there, and keep coming in. So we go to the final speaker, which is Lan Shalou, which will talk about nitrogen excretion rates for our Irish dairy cows. So over to you, Lance. Thanks, Pat. Um... So I suppose slightly different tack, but it does link with, with what Brendan and Eldie uh, have been talking about. And it goes back to the same uh, report that Eldie mentioned around the um, organic N, around the nitrogen report that DAFM asked us to, to, um, to, to work on. So basically what we're going to talk about now is our, our organic N per cow. And I suppose just to provide some context, uh, a dairy cow, uh, you know, when organic N was, was uh, first talked about, it was probably to do with reps uh, in 1994, um, and each cow had an organic N of 85. To be honest, when we look back and try to figure out where that 85 came from, we're not really sure uh, where, where, where the numbers came for that. So I suppose as part of a the Daphne request, we were, looked, we were asked to look at, you know, what should that number be now and how should it be updated? So if we just take some of the context, in 1994, when 85 was there, um, 
our, our, our average cow produced 286 kilos of milk solids, while in 2020, that's 425 kilos. Um, obviously, we've had no update until then, until 2021. We have, uh, I suppose, a new figure in 2021 that we'll talk about in a second, which was 89 kilos of organic N. Uh, and this came from, from the overall same process that we're going to talk about in a second. So I suppose just to be clear, where does organic N come from? Organic N is driven by the nitrogen intake of the cow uh, at the cow level. So you have the intake of the cow in nitrogen and you have the output uh, minus the gaseous losses. So that's where the organic N of a cow uh, comes from. And I suppose up to now, we've had one figure, that 85 kilos, irrespective of if you have a cow producing 300 kilos of milk solids or a cow producing 700 kilos of milk solids, there has been no difference that, that 85. And that's something we'll discuss a little bit in a second. So the two things that we're going to, uh, I suppose, relatively quickly go through are, firstly, we're going to talk a, a little bit about how organic N should change, has changed over time. And secondly, then we're going to talk about a banding system. And a banding system really means that we're relating organic N uh, to milk yield. So, so there are the two things we're going to talk about. We'll first talk about organic N change over time. So I suppose, again, when Daphne came to us uh, um, on this, we had to, I suppose, go back and see, could we develop a methodology to quantify the organic N or the N excretion rate from a cow? And I suppose, first of all, you know, to calculate the N intake of an animal, you have to figure out what energy requirements she has. So we included maintenance, pregnancy, body condition score, growth, and milk production in terms of the animal's uh, energy requirements. We converted that then to a requirement for gra graze grass, grass soils, and concentrate based on the... Um, uh, energy requirement of the animal, of whether they were outdoors or indoors, and and so on, uh, and obviously then that linked to you know grazing season length, grass growth, and concentrate feeding patterns. So so all this was pulled together. So I suppose then just to calculate the organic N, how do we do it? So it's the total intake of grass, grass silage, and concentrate in N terms, the nitrogen intake of those three components, uh, and then we calculate the N surplus at the animal level, which is the total nitrogen intake minus the nitrogen in uh, milk, nitrogen in the calf, and nitrogen in retained meat. So that's a surplus um, nitrogen in the system. And then to calculate the nitrogen in the uh, feces and urine, which is your nitrogen excretion rate, we have to remove gaseous losses. So that's essentially what we're doing. Uh, and we're including 10% for gaseous losses. And that's a fairly standard figure that comes from, from different EU methodologies that are used to calculate nitrogen excretion rates. So that's the approach we have we have taken. So just some of the assumptions then, and again, could be the debate around these assumptions when we were putting them together, but we're assuming that grazed grass has a crude protein of 18%, and we're going to a little bit detail, a little bit more detail on that in a second. Grass silage, 12.7%, and that's from uh, the FBA labs over a three-year period. And then the concentrate crude protein, we'll talk about a little bit more in a second, but that came from a survey that the Department of Agriculture uh, um, and Marine did a few uh, last year in 2020. So just on that one, on the cook protein and the concentrate, just to make the point that it's a very useful uh, survey. It was a survey of the mills. And I think it's important to acknowledge the, the contribution in this in terms of uh, mills providing this information back. And it's, it's showing a relatively positive story. Re basically what we're showing here is that the crude protein of the concentrate that we're offering our dairy cows is decreasing over time. So Brendan would have mentioned uh, about, you know, reducing his nitrogen surplus and reducing his nitrogen inputs. One of the ways to do that is to reduce the crude protein concentration uh, of the concentrate that's going into the diet. So that's happening at a farm level. We took this data and we included it in our organic N when we looked at organic N change over time. On the grass, again, a good bit of debate, uh, but when we look at the literature, we can see that, you know, at different times of the year, we can have quite high crude protein levels in our grasses, uh, be that in the spring or be it in the autumn. But when you take it on the round and you look at the different studies and you look at what the chemical nitrogen levels are at, at farm level versus what we, we have at research level, and I suppose just to make the point that we have very good data at research level, we probably don't have as much data at farm level. We have some studies, uh, but we took it that, you know, 18% crude protein of our, our grazed grass is probably uh, close enough to what's happening at farm level. So then to calculate the numbers and just give you an idea of what the numbers look like. And, and I just take an example of 2017 first here, and then we go into, I'll show you the rest of the years together. So in 2017, our grazed grass uh, intake was about 2.8 tons. So that was about 80.5 kilograms of nitrogen that went into the animal in grazed grass. 
Grass silage is about 1.25 tons at 12.7, so about 25.6 kilograms of nitrogen in the form of grass silage. And our concentrate intake uh, for 2017 was 908 kilos of dry matter at 18.3. So important one here is that what the DAFM had in their survey was fresh weights. These needed to be converted to dry matter. And that gives us a figure of 26.6 kilos. So the total intake of our 2017 cow of nitrogen was 172.7. In terms of uh, output then, we have milk, which was 29.4 kilograms, calf, 1.3 kilograms, retained live weight, roughly one kilogram. So the total nitrogen output of the cow in 2017 was 31.7. So putting all that together, we had 132 kilograms or 132.7 kilograms of intake of the cow. We had 31.7 of an output and we have to remove the gaseous losses of 10%, which means our organic end for 2017 was 90.9 or 91 kilos of organic end. So that was our 2017 cow. If we look at then, you know, the same process, but just in a table and looking at change over time, we can see here that when we go back to 2012, our organic end figure was 88. And over time, you know, it has been creeping up. Um, 2017, we're at 91, 2018, 94, 2019 is, is 94. I suppose if we then say to ourselves, you know, what, you know, if we were to look at an organic again figure for, you know, different periods, we can see here that uh, essentially, uh, over the period 2013 to 2017, our organic on average was 89. And that's where we have the figure today of 89 that was introduced at the start of this year uh, of 89 kilos of organic N for our average cow. It was the average of 13 to 17. If we take the average of 14 to 18, it's 90. And 15 to 19, it was 90, 91. So it is increasing uh, quite dramatically over that period of time. And if we just look at how much it's increasing by, we can see that uh, over time, we can see that um, you know, over the period 2010 to 2019, what we're saying here is that our organic N is increasing by 0.6 of a kilo per, per year. So what does that mean? So if it was 91 in 2000 and, uh, to, to, you know, 2022, uh, over a four year period, multiply that by 0.6, you'll be hitting close to 94 in, you know, four years later and so on. So it is increasing based on the last 10 years quite dramatically uh, at farm level. If we then look at some of the sensitivity analysis and look at, you know, what is the organic end of a high producing cow? And we just took an example of a cow producing seven and a half thousand kilos, being fed 1.5 tons of concentrate. And essentially what we're showing here is that cow has an organic end of 114. So a higher producing cow uh, has a much higher organic end, much higher input to the cow and much higher output uh, at the same time, but a much higher organic end. If we then just look at, you know, what's the impact? And this is really important at farm level, reducing crude protein by 1%. You know, so, you know, if that concentrate, now I think we're saying it's 16.3 on average. If that was dropped to 15.3, that's worth 1.3 kilos of organic N. So instead of the figure being 91, it would be, you know, 89.7. So that's pretty dramatic at farm level. Uh, crude protein of grades grass, every 1% reduction is 3.9 kilos and crude protein of grass silage, every 1% reduction is 1.8 kilos. So again, you know, pretty dramatic effects on the overall uh, organic end of a cow by reducing grass, grass, grass silage, or, or concentrate. So that's answering the first question that Daphne asked us. How does organic end change over time? The second question then was, if we were to develop a banding system related to milk yield, um, you know, what might that look like? And I suppose, it's important, I suppose, to give a little bit of context here. And, you know, uh, if we look around Europe, not every country, but most countries have a banding system which, which relates the organic end of the cow uh, to milk yield. Uh, and they have different bands that different uh, animals fit into. So they don't have that one figure that we have in Ireland. They relate the performance of the animal to the organic end output. And just give an example, I'm just giving two examples. The first one here being France. Um, and this is, um, you know, a French system where they have different criteria, milk yields and so on. And this shows nine bands. And actually, this is a little bit out of date. Um, my understanding is now that they have brought this up to 12 bands. So rather complex, uh, I suppose, system where we look at the Dutch um, have a different system where it just relates to milk yield. Uh, and they have uh, five bands in their system uh, related to milk yields. And you can see, you know, numbers going up quite dramatically as the milk yields go up. So then when we start to design something for Ireland, I suppose the one or two objectives we have is to make sure that it's simple to operate, 
that reflects differences in nitrogen output that relate to milk yield. Uh, and that's easy for people to understand and easy to operate. And I suppose the important thing here is that as milk yields go up, uh, that you move between the bands, that the overall organic ends don't increase dramatically per year. It's that you move between bands as milk yield goes up. So the three bands we've taken is uh, under four and a half thousand kilos of milk, between four and a half and six and a half thousand kilos of milk, and greater than six and a half thousand kilos of milk. So there are the three bands that we've taken from an Irish context. And I suppose if we just look at, you know, what representation these have and what we did was we took data, we got data uh, from ICBF and from the National Farm Survey, and we looked at the amount of farmers in each of the categories and so on. And I suppose if we look at the under four and a half thousand kilo category, on average between 2015 and 2019, 24% of suppliers were in that category, 12.6% of the milk, the average milk yield was 3,700 3, kilos, the four, 404 fat, 3.45 uh, percent protein and 770 kilograms of concentrate dry matter was fed. If we take the middle category, then they represent 65% of suppliers, 70% of the milk. So the vast majority of suppliers are in this category. Did an average milk yield of 5428, fat was 409, protein was 349, and they fed 945 kilos of dry matter or concentrate. And the final band then, uh, greater, sorry, that should say greater than six and a half thousand kilos. 11% uh, of suppliers, 17.4% of milk. The average milk yield was 7,155, uh, 401 fat, 344, and they fed on average 1.4 tons of concentrate dry matter. So they were the, band, they were the, I suppose, categories that fell into the different bands. And if we look at the numbers then, we can see that first category under 4,500 kilos had an organic N of 80. The second category had an organic N of 92, so quite similar to the, to the average that we talk about and the higher category had an organic N of 106. So they're the three categories, they're the three bands. To, to summarize, uh, organic N levels, I suppose, uh, per cow have increased and we continue to do so. As milk yields go up, there will be increases in organic N. And I suppose the milk quota regime um, slowed that process down, milk quota has gone. You know, we're seeing, I suppose, quite significant increases in fat and protein. Uh, if we stay, if we were to remain with one number, you know, for the whole country, there will be quite significant increases every three or four years when to be updated. Uh, based on the historic last 10 years, that would represent about 0.6 of a kilo of N increase per year. I suppose in relation to the banding system, uh, it, it allows organic N to relate to nitrogen output. So it's a better reflection of the, the, what's happening at farm level. So one number, irrespective of what you do at farm level, there is no link. If we have the banding system, Essentially, we have a better reflection of what's happening uh, at farm level. A couple of important points for me on the banding. Uh, it requires a lead in time. So, you know, in 2020, we had a figure of 85 for everyone in the country. Uh, if we were to move to the banding system, essentially what we'd look at is, is some, you know, higher producing herds going to 106. And they'll need time to adjust in terms of maybe some of the actions that they could take, you know, and what actions are they? You know, they could look at, uh, I suppose, reducing cow numbers. They could look at bringing more land into their system, or they could look at reducing milk yields to come under the category. So uh, they need a lead in time. The second point is, I suppose, it must be based on historic performance uh, in the sense that, you know, you can't have a farmer within any one year not knowing what band they'll fit in. So it has to be based on historic performance that allows a farmer to calculate where they are uh, at any one time. So just thank you for your attention. And just uh, it has been pointed out already, there's more information, much more detail on both what Elodie talked about and what I talked about in this uh, report that's on our website. So Pat, back to you. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, so we've gone a bit over time and we have a good few questions. So I'd ask the panel to keep their answers very snappy if you're going to try and get through all the questions. We probably won't get through all the questions, but uh, should we can answer them online afterwards. So, so Brendan, the first question is for you, Brendan. Uh, it's from Pat Murphy. Um, you mentioned soil water. What changes in practice occurred and how much of an impact do you think it had? Yeah, we, we doubled the area on which soil water was allocated. And we moved from areas that were where there was shallow soils to where there was deeper soil surface. So those two in large part affect address the soil water. It's particularly an issue in the autumn winter period where you've got saturated soils anyway. 
thanks very much, Brendan. This next one I'm going to go to is Lauren Sexton, and I think Eddie probably go have the first shot. He can comment as well. What is the minimum amount of bag nitrogen in a grass only swar to grow 12 tons of dry matter? And how much slurry and dirty water is needed to achieve this? Eddie, do you want to go with that? Yeah, that's a tricky quick question. I don't know if there's a clear answer to that because it's obviously going to depend on your farm, on your soil type, obviously soil fertility. And as we've seen for leaching, you know, we all know it's the same for grass because it's going to be very variable between year. Um, I, I went back looking what we did last year and I think it was around between 150 to 200 kilogram of nitrogen you will need depending on your soil type to yeah. achieve both 12 in yeah. average of 18 years. Yeah. And if I go back to what you showed, you were, grow, you were somewhere around 13 and a half tons yeah. or 250 kilos of nitrogen and you were, every kilo you took off you were reducing the dry matter response per kilo of N was somewhere around 15 to 17 kilos. Yeah, you yeah. can work it back off. It, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, next one is Joe Lawler. Um, high stock and race leads a 2% higher uh, leaching per hectare. But what when measures in terms of against output? It's probably a lot of similar to you is, is what's the impact of the reduced nitrogen on, on, on farm profit or farm farming? Yeah, so, and again, this is something that's in much more detail in the report, I suppose. And we, we did a fair bit of work on this, I suppose. We looked at the reduction, the impact of reduction in chemical nitrogen on profit across three scenarios, one where cow numbers reduce, two where we keep cow numbers the same and um, buy in feed, and three where we reduce cow numbers but keep, and keep fixed costs. And essentially, just to summarize, in the least negative scenario, a 10% reduction in chemical nitrogen will reduce profit by 3%. In the highest negative scenario, a 10% reduction in chemical nitrogen will reduce profit by 5%. Uh, and the same you know, for a 20% reduction, they'll double. So, you know, you're talking about 200 to 250 euros per hectare reduction in profit for a 20% reduction in chemical nitrogen, which is quite significant, I suppose, on the farm. And I suppose the point there is that any reductions in chemical nitrogen uh, need to be counteracted at farm level by better soil fertility, by maybe the introduction of clover, by the use of low emission slurry spreading, better use of slurry in the spring. Uh, you know, those strategies have to be put in place at farm level. Okay, thanks, Lawrence. Next one is for you, Brendan, uh, is from John Douglas. Could we reach good ecological status if everyone was compliant without reducing the limits? Well, so, so the ecological status is, is in-stream ecology, and uh, that's influenced by climate as much as it's influenced by the on-farm practices. And if we are speaking about, you know, drier summers and wetter winters, that's if we change no practice, the ecology declines because of that change in climate. Um, based on, I suppose, looking at where we are now, definitely as we, you know, as you, you impose nitrates directive actions, and I think most farmers do impose most of the actions anyway, so I'm not saying that there's large levels of, of non-compliance. Um, you improve those things. Building side fertility is a long-term thing though. Some of these changes require a, a lot of effort and a, a, a prolonged period. So it's not very easy to do a lot of them, you know. So improving side fertility is a long-term payback. Um, they will help. I still think probably though, given that this, this move to, you know, this drier summer so on, we probably will have to reduce the nitrogen loading to, to achieve it too. I don't think it's possible. I think it'll be both. It'll be achieving all the targets that we have today and probably some further reductions in nitrogen surpluses on farms. Okay, thanks, Brendan. There are lots of questions coming in. We won't get through them all. I'm going to keep my order here, though. Will including white clover or red clover in grazed and silage swallows boost crude protein of the feed and in turn uh, increase nitrogen excretion rate per cow? Pat Cash Patrick Cashman, Lawrence is probably for you. Excellent question. Uh, and, and the long and the short of it is you have a counteracting effect of increasing the crude, you know, you have reducing chemical nitrogen and bringing in clover that's counteracting the, the effect. The data from here, I think, suggests that there is a slight increase in crude protein of the pasture, uh, but it's not dram as dramatic as you might expect. Okay. Um, I keep going because lots more coming in. But anyhow, uh, what impact could a significant reduction in concentrate protein have on nitrogen excretion rate? I, I, Pat Murphy, I think you're dead with that, Lance, but you could just comment on it. Yeah, so every 1%, nationally where we are, every 1% reduction in crude protein is worth 1.3 kilos of organic N. So if we reduce it from... You know, where we are at the moment, 16.3 to 14.3, that's worth, you know, 2.6 kilos of organic N. Okay. Uh, from John Douglas for Lawrence, 
how much does every additional one ton of dry matter increase nitrogen use efficiency by if spreading to a maximum of 250 kilos of N per hectare? I suppose that there's a long and a short answer there. The long answer is that, that, that we need LD's model to run that through. But if we just bring down the crude protein, you know, if we talk about the nitrogen that's in a ton of, 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 of grass, you're talking about 30, 30 kilos doing it quick in my head. Uh, so if we utilize that, uh, you know, if we get that through the animal, you're going to have, you know, probably four or five percent. Uh, you know, if we're if we're naturally at twenty five percent, we probably increase that to twenty six, twenty seven percent. But you'd have to do the calculations on it to calculate mm. the impact. Uh, any quiz, quick comment, Elodie? No, not really. No. Okay. All right. We we we're nearly gone over time, and I'm, I want to get one or two more questions for Lance. Oh no, uh, yeah, for Lance, does maintenance sub index play any part in the banding process, Andrew in, in Donegal? Yeah, so so we looked at this in the original, we we've we've spent we've done a lot of scenarios here. Uh, it's not in the numbers I presented. We played around with it, including it in the in a previous version, and has a very, very small effect. It probably adds too much complication if we're going to run this at a national level. So I would say uh, the effect is so small, leave it out. Yeah, we've got a minute over. I'm going to go for the last question. Tim Gleason. Excellent talk, Brendan, Eddie, and Lawrence. My question is, if all dirty water, uh, I'm told to finish in here. Uh, uh, last question. If all dirty water uh, was stored and spread in dry weather, uh, spread in dry weather, uh, how much improvement would that would it be? Eddie, do you want to make a comment on that? Or who wants to comment? I don't mind. Difficult to say, Pat, but I mean, there's a massive economic cost to storing all the, the dirty okay. water okay. through okay. the period. Um, I, suppose, I suppose the practical thing is about reducing it really at farm level, isn't it? Well, spreading it out anyway, certainly, and trying to use it as part of the fertilizer strategy better, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I think we have to go. Uh, I'm told that we have to go. We've got to talk to two minutes. So all I can say is thanks for everyone for attending, first of all, out there publicly. Uh, thanks to the three presenters for their, for their presentation. And the next webinar is next Wednesday, next Wednesday, the 4th of August, and it's going to be on increasing energy use efficiency on Irish dairy farms. And thanks, everyone, again. Bye.